this morning from Psalm 50 in the message paraphrase. The God of gods, it's God, speaks out, shouts earth, welcomes the sun in the east, farewells the disappearing sun in the west. From the dazzle of Zion, God blazes into view. Our God makes his entrance. He's not shy in his coming. Starburst of fireworks proceeding. He summons heaven and earth as a jury. He's taking his people to court. Round up, my saints, who swore on the Bible their loyalty to me. The whole cosmos attests to the fairness of this court, that here God is judge. Are you listening, dear people? I'm getting ready to speak. Israel, I'm about ready to bring you to trial. This is God. Your God speaking to you. I don't find fault with your acts of worship, the frequent burnt sacrifices you offer. But why should I want your blue ribbon bull or more and more goats from your herds? Every creature in the forest is mine, the wild animals on the mountain, all the mountains. I know every mountain bird by name. The scampering field mice are my friends. If I get hungry, do you think I'd tell you? All creation and its bounty are mine. Do you think I'd feast on venison? Or drink draughts of goat's blood? Spread for me a banquet of praise. Serve high God a feast of kept promises. And call for help when you're in trouble. I'll help you and you'll honor me. Next, God calls up the wicked. What are you up to, quoting my laws, talking like we're good friends? You never answer the door when I call. You treat my words like garbage. If you find a thief, you make him your buddy. Adulterers are your friends of choice. Your mouth drools filth. Lying is the serious art form with you. You stab your own brother in the back, rip off your little sister. I kept a quiet patience while you did these things. You thought I went along with your game. I'm calling you on the carpet now, laying your wickedness out in plain sight. Time's up for playing fast and loose with me. I'm ready to pass sentence, and there's no help in sight. It's the praising life that honors me. As soon as you set your foot on the way, I'll show you my salvation.
Thank you.
Is there anybody here that needs a miracle? Is there anybody here that needs a promise kept from the Lord? Hallelujah! I want you to believe today that you're going to receive your answer. I want you to believe today that you're going to see a miracle. Hallelujah! Please. 
respect you, Holy Spirit, for being in this place. Father, we thank you for feeling your presence in this worship service. Thank you, Jesus, for allowing us to know who you are, giving us salvation, giving us healing, Father, giving us a reason and a purpose to exist. We love you. We respect your presence in this place. I want to start off by saying this morning that fathers, you are in desperate need. You are in desperate demand. And without you, we cannot complete the fullness of what God wants to do. Fathers, you hold the key to revival. You count. You are important. Yes, they are. I don't have time today, but we'll get to it eventually. The statistics of why our culture goes the way it goes has always come back to the microcosm of heaven in the home. That's right. Whatever happens in the home is what happens in society. Do not get that twisted. And I want us to see, I'm going to go into some teaching for the Father to be practical today, but keep that in mind. Daddies, we need you. Mama needs you. The children need you. The church needs you desperately. So are we going to create a division between you and the church by putting you down and discrediting you? Absolutely not. I'm calling on dads to become like God in the church. Thank you, Jesus. And I believe, and you say, well, I got too many problems. God can handle that. And if your family and children can see God handling you, wow, what a difference it'll make in your family. Thank you, Jesus. You are privileged to be made a father. The Bible says in Ephesians 6 and 4, Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Uh, 
Instead, bring them up. Everybody say, going up. going up. Bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Notice Colossians 3 and 21. Fathers, do not embitter your children, or they will become discouraged. According to the Boston College Social Welfare Research Institute, why those titles have to be so long? SWRI for short. This was an estimation from the early 2000s. The greatest transfer of wealth from one generation to the next will take place the next 50 years, totaling up to somewhere up to $136 trillion. Such a massive transfer of wealth and, as, and assumed consumer spending as we have seen the possibility of the stock market and new historical heights. But I want to tell you that big number it just seems unfathomable. But let me tell you what the greatest transfer of wealth of all time is and always will be. And that is the transfer of our faith in God to the next generation. The greatest. Jesus questions this particular transfer of wealth by asking in Mark chapter 8, For what shall we profit? What shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world but lose? his own soul. This is where fathers really count. Our number one calling is to transfer wealth of our faith to our children. This is the challenge that Joshua had at Shechem in 24 and 15. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods of your forefathers served beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in the, whose land you are living. But as for me, there are times you're going to have to stand alone. Even making an announcement is very lonesome sometimes because your announcement is beginning to separate you from the crowd. He said, as for me, I wish I could speak for you. I wish I could change it for you. But he realized you have the same volition as me. So as for me and my house, as for me and my sphere of influence, as for me and what's my responsibility, I'm going to serve the Lord. Hallelujah, Jesus. Yet that generation, I want you to remember the story of that generation of fathers failed their children after that great announcement. In Judges 2 and 10, after that whole generation had been gathered to their fathers, another generation grew up and knew neither the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. The greatest role of the Father is summed up in this great commandment right now. How many know, by the way, there's a generation right now being destructive that does not know God nor His words? Because destruction of people and property is not a gift of the Holy Spirit. And it's actually an indictment from their heart towards God saying, God can't do it, so I must be destructive to get something done. That's a generation that does not know the miracle power of God. And too many people don't know history anymore. I have been challenged in my later years to go back and study history, not just history about America, but the history of how God worked through men and women of God 
to get accomplished the things and the, and the purposes of God in this earth, no matter where we live. And there's history book after history book that proves that societies without God and the fear of the Lord and men being the men of God, that we find that destruction is always on the heels of failure to be the fathers. And the Bible says in Deuteronomy 6 right here, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments, these are not suggestions. These commandments that I give you today are to be upon your hearts. How can you give something to somebody you don't have? How can you, how can you give what God says if you can't do it? So whatever is on your heart is what you give away. So how can you give away what you don't have? So we realize he said he wants this to be upon your, he says upon your hearts. And then notice verse seven, impress them upon your children. Impress them upon your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road and when you lie down and when you get up. That's a lot of conversation. Every time I turn around, dad's talking about that, the Lord. Every time I turn around, he's telling the testimony. Every time I turn around, he's telling what God did that day. No matter if I'm walking down the road, he's got to bring something up about God. Whether I'm waking up in the morning, cooking eggs and bacon, he's saying something about God. When I go to sleep, all of a sudden, the last thing I hear is God, my father, talking about what the Lord is doing. Amen. Boy, would we love to have those days right now. Yes. We need those yes. days. Amen. So the Bible says in verse 8, he says, tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your house and on your gates. Can you see that the symbols and the reminders that God said to put on your house, your door? God is an interior decorator. The motif is whatever reminds you of heaven and the Lord and his works. Hallelujah, Jesus. Some, pipe, some people are into certain objects. They'll collect in their house. My mother likes roosters. Everything's a rooster. There's other things, and I think that's great. But I'm going to tell you, God is making a point here that if you will constantly remind yourself who you are in Christ, if you will constantly remind yourself why you're born here on earth. If, if you will constantly remind yourself your responsibility as father to be responsible to teach your children. Because the generation you raise up is the generation is going to take over. Because daddy, you're going to get weak and your son will get strong. And whatever strength you've made him is the monster you create or the wonderful works of God that you've passed on to the next generation. I do understand that righteous people can raise up evil people and they have choices. But the Bible says the odds are more for us when we raise up children the way they should go than against us. So fathers play a unique role in the lives of their children there to reflect the fatherhood of God. And what kind of father is God? Let's just think about that for a moment. You want a model father? Let's find out what father God is like. The Bible says in Psalm 68, 5, father to the fatherless, hallelujah. What if your neighbor doesn't have a father and you are the, their neighbor? As a father, you can be an example because your neighbors are watching you. You can invite them over in evangelistic situations. You can allow them to be influenced by what you teach your children. Also, the, he's the father of provision. Our father in heaven is who we're to model. He's the father of provision. Matthew says, if you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your father in heaven give good gifts to those who who ask him. He's also the father of compassion and comfort. The Bible says in Corinthians, praise be to the God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ, 
the father of compassion. Do y'all see that? He's the father of compassion and the God of all what? Comfort. Hallelujah. He's also the father of lights, of perfect gifts. Hallelujah. James says every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the father of the heavenly lights who does not change like shifting shadows. You can always come back home to God and he's the same loving God as if you left him. Watch this. He's also the father of impartiality. The Bible says, since you call on a father who judges each man's work impartially, live your lives as strangers here in reverent fear. Somebody say amen. amen. Knowing God as father gives us a great sense of security in an insecure world. And for the Bible says, Romans, do not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear. If something's causing you to fear in the movement of our society, it is not of God. Amen. But you receive the spirit of what? Sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. Somebody say amen to Abba, Father. The Bible says Abba in Aramaic means daddy. He's your daddy, hallelujah. He loves you, hallelujah. He is for you and not against you. And he wants to raise you up because you are his son and you are his daughters. Hallelujah, somebody. So what does it take to be a father like God? A father whose children were adults set up this answering machine. And the machine had this message. If you are, if you require financial assistance, press one. <laughs> if you are in emotional turmoil over an impending breakup with a romantic partner and require a few hours of sympathetic discussion, press two. If you are being treated unfairly at work or school and wish to displace your anger to a nuclear family member, press three. If your car or household appliances need immediate repair or replacement, press four. If you are telephoning to inquire about our well-being or to pass a few moments of pleasant conversation, please recheck the number you have intended to dial. <laughs> Did y'all get that? Yeah. Fathers would like to hear something more than fixing your problems over the telephone. Paul gives two powerful principles in these passages that we've read and uh, for how a father can be a father like God. Number one is we need to exclude the negatives. Do not exacer uh, ex exacerbate or um, embitter is another way of saying it. Embitter your children. To arouse anger, to irritate or frustrate Embitter to show bitterness or harshness, impatience, lack of tenderness, which leads to discouragement. What a terrible thing to discourage a child. It's a terrible thing to discourage a child. Even the disciples, if you remember, even the disciples on one occasion was discouraging children to come to Jesus Christ. And what did Jesus do? He corrected them. And the Bible says in Mark 10, people were bringing little children to Jesus to have him touch them. But the disciples rebuked them. When Jesus saw this, he was indignant. He said to them, let the children come to me and do not hinder them for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. I tell you the truth, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. And he took the children in his arms, put his hands on them, and the Bible says that he blessed them. We need to understand these children, the children you have are not the pain in the neck. 
They are going to take over one day. And there's an old adage that says, the hand that rocks the cradle rules the earth. So you realize how fathers, let me go into just some things now some, to be practical. Number one, abuse. We know that. Many people in this room have experienced it. Physical, psychological, emotional. Our prisons are filled with people who are abused as children. Another one is just neglect. Spending time with kids is a priority number one. Spending time, sometimes love is spelled T-I-M-E. And you gotta realize failure to understand them and treat them, each child needs to be treated uniquely. They're not all the same. They all have a, a, a proclivity about them and a bent about them that you need to nurture and understand. Failure to understand this is going to be disaster. Unrealistic expectations. There are times you gotta realize that your child can't do a certain thing until they get to a certain level. Perfectionists. The perfectionist standards, which no one can really meet, that also has a way of and causing a child to be bitter because more is expected of them than they are capable to deliver. And stifling their uniqueness and creativity is also a problem because <clears throat> you gotta study your children to know who they are and what they are. They're not all like mama and they're not all like daddy. They may be somebody else in your family they're like. Negative or positively. But stifling their uniqueness and creativity causes the children to be embittered. So we got to realize, why is this important? You say, I agree with all of this, preacher. So how do I do that if I'm guilty of it? When you don't spend time with your children, you can't study who they are. If, the, if you're going to allow the schools which now do not teach, they indoctrinate, then you are setting yourself up for disaster. You see, you gotta realize that spending time is the way you understand their uniqueness. You don't know their uniqueness unless you spend time, unless you study. And you say, well, I don't have time for that. You shouldn't have children. That's the bottom line. You should not have children. If you don't have time to invest in your children, you should not have any. Somebody says, I think that's harsh. I don't care. <laughs> People can go out and have their pleasures, but they don't want to have the responsibility. Not allowing them some freedom to think for themselves. Now, I'm going to clarify that because there is, we're not saying that you let children run the house. If children are running your house, your house is out of order. Amen. I've been to many homes over the years where the children run the house. I wanted to slap the parents. <laughs> Amen. That's not freedom. That's, that's irresponsibility. Giving them freedom means you give them opportunity to think about what you're teaching them and find out how they react. That's the kind of freedom I'm talking about. A freedom to be able to ask questions about your faith. And the problem sometimes is that if you're saying one thing but you are living another and they ask you a question, it makes you mad because their question convicts you. All right. And now you've made the child... Embittered. Watch this. Forcing them to accept our ideas and opinions, let them ask questions about faith and values. As teenagers, that's the time they're going to start trying to sort out whether they believe what daddy has said, mama has said, or not. 
But as for me and my house, if you're a teenager, I don't care if you are a 40-year-old teenager. You're living in my house. We still serve the same God that grew up that when you grew up here. Yeah. But at the same time, I don't mind being able to be, sometimes to be challenged is hard. It's hard to be challenged by the questions of the innocent. Because it makes us think about where we are. So listen to their opinions sometimes. I didn't say agree with them, but listen to their opinions so that you can find out where are you getting this? Tell me how you got this. Where did you study this? Where have you come up with this idea? Because if you don't have these conversations with your children, then the one they're having the conversation with has the upper hand. So you got to listen to them to know where they are and then begin to discuss no or yes if this is right by God. But then again, you have to be studied up. You have to be ready. And if you're not ready and you got kids now and you've made some mistakes and you'd like to get it right, well, the church is here to help you. You can get help from other parents that have been successful and have, and, and have make some effort of wanting to be a part of your child's even adult years. And you can say, I've made mistakes. You can say, I, I wish I'd have done it a different way. That's one of the greatest things you can tell your child if you've grown up and they've grown up in the wrong atmosphere and you finally changed. You can say, I was wrong. That's probably one of the greatest things you could ever tell your children when you want to influence them. Because they don't mind you being vulnerable. There will be some that will take advantage of it. I'll give you that. But that would be now between them and God. But as for me, as you say, and as the word says, we've got to stay the course. Because there is no chance. Because one day, if they see how consistent you love the Lord and how the Lord blesses you, they'll come back to you one day because a problem will not be answered by anybody else as much as the parent because the parent has a, uh, a love for them that no other human will have. Amen? Amen? Kids can make decisions and they're going to make decisions opposite of ours. But stay the course because one day your consistency will be an attraction and they will come and they will want to listen and they want to honor you to see what God has done in your life because many a times as we've seen it, teenagers, college years, they leave the church, but they come back to a consistent place. And it's amazing how many times when they come back, they want it back the way, exactly the way it was when they left it. I find that so interesting. And we've kind of moved on a little bit, gotten more, you know, educated, especially on music. They want to come back to the same time and theme of music and style of church. Many times, many times that happens. And all that is saying is, I miss the way it was. You are right. I want to come home. Does that make any sense? Watch this. Failure to admit when we're wrong is one of the worst things you can do if you're wrong as a parent. Modeling double standards is another thing. It's not how we talk, but how we walk that influences the child. That do as I say, not as I do. I remember hearing that so many times. And that does any, that just frustrates children. Just frustrates. And now let's accentuate the positive. We went through the negative. Now let's accentuate the positive. Fathers need to take a positive approach in raising their children up. Instead of being overbearing and harsh and too rigid. There are some important Greek words in Ephesians chapter 6 verse 4 as we read. And I'm going to use one of them. That phrase, bring them up. I like this phrase because it stands in contrast in putting children down. It has a ring of ascent to it instead of descent. And then everything we do as parents needs to bring up 
our children never put them down or discourage them. It has been said that adolescence is the age when children try to bring up their parents. <laughs> the phrase bring them up in the Greek means to nourish up to maturity. I like the upward movement, don't you? Bring them up. Let's lift them up. Let's get them up here. In Ephesians 4, the Bible says to prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. We are in preparation with our children. In Jude 1 and 20, the Bible says that, but you, dear friends, build yourselves up in your most holy faith and pray in the Holy Spirit. First Corinthians says, now about food sacrificed to idols, we know that we all possess knowledge. Knowledge puffs up. But watch this. Remember this. With your children, with that knowledge, you got to love. You got to love. Yeah. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. And then also in Corinthians, for even if I boast somewhat freely about the authority the Lord gave us for building you up, rather than putting you down, I will not be ashamed of it. Watch this. Then we see the word training. Everybody say training. training. Here it is again. This is parents on the job. This is daddy at home. This is daddy spending time. This is mama spending time too. Then we see this word training in the Greek meaning to nurture or discipline. Discipline. It embraces the ideas of education, instruction, and correction. You must correct that child. The Bible says if you don't correct the child, you don't love them. The focus is on moral development through commands, admonitions, and correction. See, finally, the word instruction. Everybody say instruction. instruction. Means exhortation, admonition, and encouragement. You see, here's a real life to apply this. Watch this. Real life application. So what can fathers do on a practical basis to put these principles into practice? Genesis 6, 9 says, Noah was a righteous man. A righteous man. Blameless among the people of his time. And he did what? He walked with God. Men need to make it their ambition to be men like Abraham. You're, you should not be role modeling yourselves af after sports figures. They're the worst role models on the earth. They get all the money and play the life of, of adultery and all these other things they get to do with their big money. That's not role models, folks. Be men like Abraham, who was a friend of God. A friend of God. Like Moses, who spoke with God face to face. This is the role model that we must not forget. Like David, a man after God's own heart. That's the role model we need in the church for the men and the fathers. Paul, who said is, uh, his highest aspiration was, I want to know Christ. If there's anything you're, as a father, you need to want to study, you need to want to know Christ. You want to study him. You want to know him. You want to be able to answer questions about him. You want to be able to brag about him. You want to be able to model him. You want to be able to hear the mind of Christ come to your mind and speak it to a child's problem. And the child sees that problem taken care of by the wisdom that comes by the Holy Spirit. And it takes knowing Christ to have that wisdom. Somebody say amen. amen. You see, go ahead. Give him great thanks and praise. These, these men had a personal, close relationship with God. Somebody said, you know, I was really wanting to hear something super fantastic and, 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 and crazy spiritual and some kind of nugget that nobody's ever heard before. You come to the wrong place. <laughs> We're going to go back to the Bible, folks. God doesn't make secrets along the way that nobody can know about. It's written right here. The Bible is the only book where the author is always present. You've got to understand, he's ready to teach it to you. Yeah. 
He's ready to give it to you, that wisdom. These men had a personal, close relationship with God. You can't give your children religion. And, the, and listen to that phrase. You can't give them the religion, especially that you have. You must help them see by your own walk with God that they too can have a personal relationship with the Lord. And that relationship will be the most important one they will enjoy in this lifetime. Keep your head in tough times, Daddy. Keep your head. Job furloughs you. The monies are drying up. Disease may have come in. You've been defrauded, stolen from. You've been hurt. These are the times you have to keep your head. You've got to think. Through tough times. Adolescence is when that child tries to raise the parents. Don't overreact when they rebel. Hold your ground. I said, hold your ground, Daddy. Hold your ground. But give them room to fail. I ain't doing that. I really do. I, I don't want to do that. It's hard. You don't want to see your child fail. You don't want to see that. But God gave you room to fail so you'd make it honest choice. Sometimes you got to give them room. In other words, don't be an enabler. Somebody said, you had to go there. <laughs> Remember the parable of the prodigal son? Father gave him latitude to make choices and trusted that what he taught his child would come back to his senses and he'd want to come back home. And that's what happened. Treat each child uniquely. You see, because the Bible says, and this is one of the most misunderstood scripture, I think, when it comes to child rearing. I want you to get this again. The Bible says, train a child in a way he or she should go. And when he or she is old, he or she will not. Will not what? Turn from it. You said, but I raised my child in the church. And now they're on meth. Now they're drug addicts. Now they're doing the total opposite of what they've ever been taught. They have adopted the culture's way of living. And they were raised in the church. You saw God touch them and fill them with the Spirit. You saw them weep and cry all their lives growing up. And knowing that the Holy Spirit touched that child. And you're telling me that this verse works? I trained that child. And what happened? They're out there doing the devil's work. I'm going to tell you again what this verse means. It does not mean that you modify, edit, or come up with a new plan, a new curriculum to train your children. You stick with the plan. The way they were raised, you stay the course. We were just talking about it. My wife and Nathan on the way from Carolina got a statistic and I looked it up. This cultural movement that we see, this cultural unrest is started and fueled mostly by millennial girls. Do the research. We'll talk more about it another day. And the girls are influencing the parents out of college. Parents, where are you? Father, take authority. Amen. Daddy's girl should be on fire for Jesus. Not for disrupting and destroying society. Train up a child in the way it should go. That is our responsibility. The second part of that verse is God's responsibility. There's two responsibilities in that verse. Train up a child in the way it should go. That's your and my responsibility. And when he is old, how many know when they get older, they have to answer to God all by themselves? And you say, thank God. It hurts us. 
it makes us weep and cry and that's what it should do. And you think that they've forgotten everything they've ever learned in the church growing up. That is not true. Because the Bible guarantees they won't forget that. They may suppress it. They may hide it. They may ignore it. But they can't forget it. And there's a moment where that seed is going to come alive again. And the Bible says that, that when they get old, when they start looking for options, they always remember the option Daddy and Mama gave them. Just like the prodigal son. Do y'all see that? Do your job in training them up in the Lord. You will make mistakes. We all do. But stay with the Lord. Stay consistent with God. Because there's a day coming that God's going to take that word you put inside them and bring that child home. Somebody say amen right now. I got to start quitting. Believe in your children. I didn't say believe their lies. But believe that inside of them there's something God still wants to bring out of them. Believe in your children. It has been said of Jesus that in company of sinners, he dreamed of saints. We need to look beyond a child's problems and see their potential. Jim Lovell, the Apollo 13 astronaut, said in his review of their survival of the mission, I never thought I didn't have a card to play. We always have a card to play. His name is Jesus. Don't forget it. Love your children no matter what and show them that you love them. You know, the Bible says in 1 John 4 and 18, the Bible says this, there is no fear in love. There's no fear in love. We've experienced some situations, maybe some of us experienced bad situations growing up. But you understood the difference between the one who loves and the one who didn't. Right. The one who loved, you never, you never felt like you had to be afraid to approach them with your problem, to approach them with your situation. You knew that that parent was going to love you first and then correct you second. To my child, I'm going to close with this. To my child, things I can and cannot do. The author is unknown. I don't know who the author is. To my child, things I can and cannot do. I can share your life, but I cannot live it for you. I can teach you things, but I can't make you learn. I can give you directions, but I can't always lead you. I can allow you freedom but I can't account for it. I can take you to church, but I can't make you believe. I can teach you right and wrong, but I cannot decide for you. I can give you love, but I cannot force it upon you. I can teach you to be a friend, but I can't make you be one. I can teach you to share, but I cannot make you unselfish. I can teach you respect, but I cannot force you to show honor. I can tell you the facts of life, but I cannot build your reputation. I can tell you lofty goals, but I can't achieve them for you. I can teach you to obey, but I cannot answer for your actions. I can warn you about sins, but I cannot make you moral. I can love you as my child, but I cannot place you in God's family. I can pray for you, but I cannot make you walk with God. I can teach you about Jesus, but I can't make you, I can't make him your savior. I can teach you about prayer, but I can't make you pray. I can tell you how to live, 
but I cannot give you eternal life.